Moderation is one of the key virtues of Stoicism. But do you apply moderation to Stoicism itself? Or do you pursue an extreme version of Stoicism? According to the philosopher Seneca, you should definitely apply moderation to Stoicism itself too. Because at the end of the day, that is what he did. In fact, sometimes he didn't even live like a Stoic in the first place. Or he didn't live the way that most people would assume a Stoic would live like. If we compare Seneca with other Stoics, then he certainly has his own perspective on Stoicism and he did in fact humanize it quite a bit. He made it a bit more accessible to us ordinary human beings that simply don't follow this extreme philosophical humble approach. And that's what we're going to talk about in today's video. But before we get into it, what's going on powerful people? My name is Benjamin and I welcome you to today's video. If you're new to the channel, consider hitting the subscribe button so you're not missing out on any future videos. A huge shout out to Elizy, David Rose, Gary Minar, Aaron C and Kieran Broadley for supporting me on Patreon. I truly appreciate it. But without further ado, let's actually get straight into it. Today, we're summarizing another letter from Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. And as we already talked about, moderation is one of the key aspects today. But the first lesson is actually to constantly improve yourself. Because Seneca writes to a younger Stoic that he is admiring the sacrifices that he's making to constantly strive to better himself. The sacrifices that he's making to become a better human being, to become a better Stoic, to become more virtuous, to simply improve yourself. Whatever you do, always keep in mind that this improvement should somewhat be part of your journey. Wherever you're going, Whatever your purpose may be, at least try on the side to have the slight improvements. Make some sacrifices. Spend some time reading instead of watching Netflix. Spend some time with quality mentors instead of spending your time on video games. Just spend some of your time very usefully and improve yourself. The second lesson is to be different inwardly. Seneca says, that philosophy in itself is already a very odd choice. Meaning if you study philosophy, if you deal with philosophical questions, if you want to live a life according to Stoicism or any philosophy, then that's a very odd choice and people will already eyeball you a little bit. They will look a little bit weird at you because it's just not the normal thing to do. Now this is where Seneca is probably contradicting a lot of other Stoic philosophers like for example Marcus Aurelius. Because Seneca says, hey, you already picked up philosophy, which is a fucking weird choice if we're being honest. So now that you've decided to do that, you don't have to take it one step further. You don't actually have to embody all of these stoic virtues or all of these philosophy values in general. He says, hey, you are weird enough already. If you now also begin sleeping on the floor, if you begin running around in these very weird odd looking clothing styles. If you begin practicing all of this extreme discomfort, then you distance yourself from your fellow man even more. You're already this weird philosopher, so you already are very far away from other people. But if you now take it one step further, then you just distance yourself way too much. Seneca says, the highest goal or one of the first goals of philosophy is to be in touch with your fellow man. And if you just distance yourself so far from them, then you simply don't have this fellowship anymore. You're losing that aspect. And this is something that you shouldn't do. So instead of saying, okay, I'm gonna be the ideal philosopher, he says, be somewhere between the ideal and your fellow man. Play the middle. Be a philosopher on the inside but not on the outside. Conform with all of the social conventions. Live a very ordinary life. Live a life like all your friends, like everyone else is living. Don't try to be special. Don't try to receive this recognition for being something extraordinary. Just fit in. People will look up to you or will admire you for what is inside. They shouldn't admire you for the things that you have, but they also shouldn't admire you for living on the street and running around like a dirt poor philosopher. And this is a point where he might actually be firing some shots towards Socrates 
because let's face it, if you've seen the series on Socrates, he was a dirt poor philosopher that just ran around through the streets, not even wearing shoes, dirty clothing, not very clean at all, and just annoying people with some very deep questions and trying to show them how little they actually know. So Socrates was very heavily on the ideal side of philosophy. He lived with the absolute minimum. You could call him the ideal philosopher. Seneca, on the other hand, prefers a more moderate, balanced approach to this entire thing. He says, be somewhere between the extreme ideal form and your fellow man, so you don't lose the connection. And he actually takes his argument one step further by saying, hey, we should live according to nature. That's a core idea of stoicism. So why don't we do it? Because according to Seneca, living like the ideal philosopher, just eating bread, sleeping on the floor and having all of this discomfort is torture to your own body. And if it is torture to your own body, then how are you living in accordance with nature? You should live in accordance with nature and that also means that your base needs need to be fulfilled to some extent. And not just to this very cheap extent where you sleep on the floor, but to a comfortable extent. So Seneca has a much more applicable, humanized approach to Stoicism than for example Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus. And he continues his argument in the next lesson, which is avoiding extremes in general. He brings up the example that you don't need golden plates. But he also says you don't need to hate golden plates. You can still have them. You just need to have the inner mental distance to the entire thing. You don't need to think that golden plates will show people how fabulous you are. But you also don't need to think that if you hate golden plates, then people will see what a humble philosopher you are. You need to be in the middle somewhere. You need to say to yourself, okay, I can live with golden plates, but I also can live when I don't have them. I don't really worry about it too much because what you should worry about at best is what is going on inside of you. Which brings us back to the previous lesson, which said that we should focus on being different inwardly. And he actually says that people shouldn't admire you for the things that you have, but they should admire you for the person that you are on the inside. And this is where I actually want you to think about this a little bit. Because is this really something that you should strive for? That people admire you? Is this really a stoic virtue? That people admire you for the person who you are? Should that really matter to you? I mean, it's clear that people shouldn't admire you for the possessions that you have. That's a very materialistic approach and doesn't align with Stoicism at all. But does admiration align with Stoicism if it is for the person? Or is this still a thing that we shouldn't worry about because let's face it. What good does it do you if we know that this person likes us very much, this person admires us and so on and so forth. Is that really a Stoic thing? That's what I'm asking you and that's what I would ask Seneca if he would be still living. Before we get to the last lesson, please click the like button for me. I truly appreciate it. The last lesson is cease to hope and you will cease to fear. Because hope and fear come hand in hand. They are intertwined. They belong together. They work together and they always come as a pair. So if you constantly hope for a better future, then you also have the attached fear to it. If you hope that everything will be better, then you also have the fear that everything could not become better, let alone become worse. You will always fear something in the future. And he takes this one step further and says, hey, if you live for hope in the future, then you have the fear about the future as well. If you, on the other hand, constantly think about the past, your memories, how things were, then you also have the agony of the past. And both of these are not really something that you should indulge in or that you should worry about. What you instead should do is be in the present moment. Because in the present moment, you can't experience these unnecessary fears about the future and you can't experience the pain of past events. If you're in the present moment, then you're just here and you experience what is going on. You really take in all the beauty around you and you can think about it clearly. You don't need to obsess over what is coming later. You don't need to obsess over what is already done. Just 
be in the present moment and really live the present moment without fear. And that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please click the subscribe button so you're not missing out on any future videos. Another huge shout out to Elizy, David Rose, Gary Minna, Aaron C and Kieran Broadley for supporting me on Patreon. I have two more videos for you right here that you should probably watch next. I wish you a wonderful day and I will be seeing you in the very next video.